Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Jessa Frost. I'm the program director at North House Folk School. And it's great to see so many familiar names in the column of participants and wonderful to see uh, hopefully some new folks too just encountering us for the first time. If you haven't visited North House before, we are a school of traditional Northern craft and in normal times. Uh, we welcome thousands of students um, from all over the US and Canada to our campus right on the shore of Lake Superior in Grand Marais, Minnesota, which is pretty much the end of the road. Uh, students come from all over and they learn um, traditional skills like timber framing and weaving, um, how to make mukluks, uh, how to build a dovetail sauna, um, and how to bake artisan bread. The list goes on. We offer over 400 classes a year, normally. But since we can no longer welcome everyone to our campus right now, we have, for the last uh, seven or so weeks, been offering a pretty wide range of digital options uh, for people called Crafting in Place. And it's a series designed to feature our incredibly talented community of artisan instructors. Um, in the last six or seven weeks, we have been hiring artists to produce over 36 different videos and webinars and live events uh, so that they can tell their story. And we've been bringing it to the world entirely free uh, because we believe that Northern craft and connection and community is one of the things that is going to help us all survive in this really weird time that we're living in. Uh, so thank you to the generous support of many of you um, who have made all of this work possible and who have allowed us to open the virtual doors of North House, even though uh, we can't throw open the doors to the red building or the blue building right now. Um, if you'd like to support us going forward uh, so that we can continue doing this kind of work, there is um, an option to do that on our website, which is northhouse.org. And then of course, there's also access to all this content that we've been producing. So you can take a video tour of a Grindbeeg, you can uh, learn how, you can watch weaving and felting and all kinds of things uh, right at that website. Uh, I would like to mention that right now, we do have a membership challenge going where if you become a new sustaining member where you make a monthly gift um, of any amount, we have a, a, someone who will match it uh, with an additional $75. So that is uh, an important part of how we've been making this happen. So before we get started, I do want to give a quick overview of how Zoom works in case you haven't been to a Zoom webinar before. So here's what I want you to know. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you may probably have a few options. And if you're on a tablet, you may need to hold, um, kind of touch the screen to make them appear. The options are to chat or to raise your hand. Um, and Q&A is another one or polling. Um, you can use any of these if you have questions during the webinar, you can uh, type them into that Q&A section. Or if you'd rather ask your question live, um, you can click raise your hand. Um, and at, uh, when we get to the question section, I'll turn on your mic and you can go ahead and ask your question and we can hear you ask it. Um, but if you'd rather just type it into the Q&A section, I'll make sure that uh, Lonnie gets a chance to answer it. Uh, so feel free to raise, type in your question or raise your hand at any time, but we'll probably answer questions um, at the end of the presentation. Um, you can also use your chat window to send messages to everybody in the webinar. So if there's something you wanted to say, you can certainly do that. And I think that's all of my Zoom housekeeping information. So let me move to the main reason that we're all sitting in front of our screens again tonight. Um, I'd love to introduce our featured guest, Lonnie Dupree. Lonnie is known to most of the world as a polar explorer, a mountaineer, and a climate activist. But at North House, we know that him as one of our woodworking instructors and a guy who's been around at North House helping make things happen, everything from being a board member to sweeping the floors to making puppets for the summer puppet pageant. Uh, Lonnie's been around since the school started and has been a really important friend and neighbor. Uh, so we are really happy tonight to hear him reminisce about some of his trips 
uh, to Greenland, which is one of the places and uh, that has inspired a lot of the craft that we uh, have offered and to hear about what is coming up in the future for him. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Lonnie. Lonnie, are you ready? I am ready. I'm All ready. right. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Jessa. Uh, well, thank you. Thank everybody for showing up uh, on our Zoom uh, presentation tonight. Um, wow, I'm going to uh, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that uh, we did 20 years ago uh, called the International Greenland Expedition. It was a project to uh, attempt the first circumnavigation of Greenland and do it all non-motorized by kayak and dog team. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about that and then I'll talk a little bit about this uh, whole COVID thing we're stuck in and uh, how to look at it more like an expedition and uh, have a bit of an optimistic view uh, with a little silver lining attached to it. So, um, so I'll get on with Greenland and then at the end we can answer any questions you might like, um, might want to uh, ask and uh, I'll get rolling with my, whoop, with my thing. Oh, I wonder why it's not on. Oh, maybe I got a, uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, here we go. Uh, so this is, um, this is Greenland. Greenland's a huge place. It's uh, 1,700 miles long, about 750 miles wide at its widest point. And uh, Greenland is, uh, is a place I call where ice is born because the majority of your North American icebergs are, come from Greenland and um, um, the, whole, the whole of Greenland is basically ice cap. And what holds that ice cap in the middle part or in the main part of Greenland is the whole island is uh, ringed in a periphery of uh, mountains that really hold that ice in the middle and then that ice sometimes wants to push out uh, those fjords and calve off icebergs and uh, and then they tend to uh, congregate pretty much around Greenland but then eventually they float south uh, past Newfoundland and uh, down where we are. Uh, so um, the, the red uh, line in the north there is what we did by dog team um, and the southern uh, section by kayak. This expedition took us uh, just over five years and um, uh, 6,500 miles around. And I did that with one other person, uh, John Holger from Australia. Um, we had to place depots in the north. You can see little black triangles to support our dog, dog sled expedition. And then during the kayak journey, even though we had some of our journeys were up to 700 miles between villages, um, we used the villages uh, as resupply or we hunted and fished along the way. Uh, sometimes we collected mushrooms, sometimes we collected uh, uh, mussels to eat, things like that. Uh, we'd put out a long line for fish uh, during the evening and in the morning we'd check the lines to see what we caught. And that's pretty much how we sustained ourselves around this. Now this expedition was 20 years ago and uh, of course a lot has changed since then. Um, like I'd mentioned, it's a, a, a land of snow and ice and uh, it's a place where icebergs is born. And so, Anytime you're around the coast of Greenland, whether it's in kayaks or by dog team, this is usually what you see is just a, a plethora of icebergs uh, hugging the coast of Greenland. Some quite beautiful, up to a couple hundred feet tall, uh, all shapes and sizes. Some even have um, big circular archways cut into the um, bottom part of the iceberg. And this this feature on this particular iceberg was probably created when it was up on uh, the Greenland ice cap and before it got calved into a berg that this was probably a subterranean river that uh, flowed underneath the ice cap that created this arch. Um, and now it, here it is floating in the ice. And then from above, of course, you can see exactly how deep those bergs are. Um, a lot of times they're only, uh, uh, 
a lot of times uh, 80% of that iceberg's below the water line. And so when we got close to these bergs like this, we had to be careful of two things uh, when we were kayaking. One, uh, the iceberg, if it's really broke uh, sharp and broken up, it can, it's a new iceberg and it can cab big chunks of ice the size of homes into the water and capsize you if you happen to be going by. Or if you get too close, you can also get a piece of ice coming from underneath uh, the berg that has broken off and comes to the surface, which is very scary. We had it happen once where the water started boiling underneath us. We had no clue what was going on. We hurry up and paddled away from that area and a big, huge uh, chunk of ice came up from the bottom. Uh, so it was just like, huh, didn't think of that one. <laughs> Um, and then the coastline, typical coastline of rock and ice. Uh, the shoreline of, of Greenland is pretty, especially in the uh, central part and northern part of Greenland, the shoreline's pretty much just rock uh, with little bits of lichen and some vegetation in the cracks. Um, and you won't get any uh, vegetation until you get deeper down into the fjords. Um, but this is typically what the coast looks like here. Um, and then again, um, you know, the, in the summertime, the icebergs flowing around make all different kinds of shapes and sizes. This picture was actually taken in the southernmost tip of Greenland, um, down by Cape Farrell. Uh, you can see the mountains there behind that piece of ice. They're almost a mile sheer in height. Um, then you get the sun cupped ice, which is basically uh, very crystal clear ice that's been floating in the uh, ocean for quite some time. And uh, from bobbing back and forth in the water and the sun hitting it, hitting it, it creates this sun cupped effect, uh, like, uh, like crystal almost. I went around and I spent five and a half years with this guy going around uh, Greenland. His name is John Holger and he says to get around Greenland you don't have to be nuts but it helps <laughs> as he's holding this jar of nuts peanut butter. Um, but I couldn't ask for a better team member. He was uh, I think uh, just one of the uh, well most well-rounded person I know um, and, and I think what uh, the first qualification for an expedition team member needs needs to be they have to be happy go lucky and uh, John was cer certainly that and uh, looking for an adventure um, when we uh, so we we used uh, two types of methods for uh, getting around Greenland we used two separate necky kayaks that we uh, lashed together like you're seeing here and then we had a ro little roller reef sail um, that we hope to use on the west coast. This turned out to not work very well because um, not that it wasn't a good sailing rig, uh, we were only able to sail uh, 165 miles of the 3,500 miles we actually kayaked and that mainly is because uh, the winds were only prevailing for good sailing uh, during a storm. And uh, that meant we could only sail the very front edge of each storm that would come on, and then we'd have to get off the water and get to safety. So the sailing part around Greenland wasn't very well, uh, uh, really good for sailing. So we ended up paddling most of this. So a lot of times we kept the boats uh, tied together for long crossings and we could uh, use the small canoe paddles to move our way along. And then when it got safer, we could cut the lashings, separate the boats, paddle them separately. And then on the west coast or on the east coast, we used a different method altogether. We used a single double uh, necky uh, kayak where we were, uh, that we found actually worked much, much better. Uh, and I would highly recommend a double kayak when you're doing any expedition, Arctic expedition kayaking, because using a double kayak is uh, extra safe. It's uh, more stable. It's faster than a single. Uh, if you flip the boat over, you have a partner there to help uh, rewrite the boat and get, and get somebody in the boat. Um, um, so there's many, many reasons I would go with a double boat over two singles on an expedition. Um, this is a, what a typical village looks like on, uh, on the Greenland West Coast. Uh, all the houses are painted primary colors. 
um, which is a beautiful site on the otherwise gray rock, rock and just ice or uh, snow or what have you. And so um, um, that's, uh, that's what a typical village looks like. And then uh, <clears throat> we start, I'm gonna show some of the kayak pictures here from our uh, east coast of Greenland, um, kind of what the terrain looks like here. Very mar mountainous uh, terrain, like I had mentioned, uh, uh, with lots of ice. And so back 20 years ago, the ice, you'd have consolidated pack ice from right to the shore edge out to about five miles out from Greenland. So that whole periphery of Greenland is usually jam-packed with ice until you get really late into the summer. And it's one of the reasons Greenland has never been circumnavigated then or since uh, John and I completed that. Um, and you can give, it gives you, this give you a little picture of how um, the kayaking, the type of kayaking you would have on the east coast. It's just a mix of multi-year sea ice that's pressed up against the shoreline and then uh, John and I uh, uh, getting out and resting in our double boat on, on a piece of ice and some, a lot of times we'd have to uh, get out of the boat, climb up a, a, a little island or a, a old iceberg and view the route ahead to see where it was the easiest to, to paddle. Um, and um, <clears throat> a lot of times it was overcast and you couldn't see you just had to you just had to keep going um, um, forward and 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 just uh, hoping that you will have enough uh, water to paddle in when we couldn't paddle anymore we'd have to get out and uh, drag our boats across the ice and that could be anywhere from a you know a few hundred feet to uh, several miles um, <clears throat> we'd constantly be looking at the map, John and I would, when we'd pull our boat up on a, on a little ice pan, we'd look at the map and see where, where is, a, is the ice ahead of us being stopped? Is it by a land head? Um, can we get in, can we go closer to land and find maybe a passage? Do we have to go further out to sea, which is more dangerous? Um, so we are constantly, um, kind of monitoring what the sea ice could be doing in front of us based on what's what was ahead of us but also what what the wind was doing was the wind coming off the ice cap or was it coming from the ocean all those kind of things uh, played into our decision making process and of course sometimes we just got stuck and uh, this is what we call a consolidated pack ice here or ba ba basically it's called consolidated brash ice this is where you get ice that's anywhere from golf ball size to you know big chunks and you uh the 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 ocean currents have pressured it in such a way that you can't paddle in this stuff and you can't get out and walk on it either so you're really stuck so the only thing we could do is use a gaff hook that i have in my hand john and i both had one and we would reach ahead um grab a hunk of ice and we would move the boat a half long, a boat length ahead. And then we would do that again and again and again all day until we got to some stable piece of ice where we could either set up the tent or at least get out and get on, get up on something higher so we could see the route ahead of us and where to go. We were pretty played out here after a long day with still no place to camp. Um, I remember John and I, we were in a predicament like that, um, not quite that consolidated. And I looked up in, on the, the mountainside and I seen a polar bear up there playing uh, with two cubs way up, long ways away. It seemed like, seemed like it was a mile from where we were sitting in the boat. And we were watching it and watching her. And then all of a sudden she stops and looks in our direction and then like a big bobsled, like a big seal, put her arms behind her and started sliding down this mountainside, this big hill with her two cubs right in our direction. And she was at the edge of the uh, ocean, right at the edge of where our kayak was in lickety split. And we were panicking, right? We were, we were like, this is a marine mammal, it can swim. 
we have very little, very little water to paddle in. We didn't know how to get away. Um, but luckily, uh, she smelled us. And uh, when she got one whiff of the two of us that haven't had a bath in a month, she and her cubs went over the hillside pronto, never to be seen again. <laughs> Thank God. Um, uh, so like I mentioned, sometimes we get to these uh, flow edges where you just couldn't uh, do anything other than pull the boat across. And so since the boat was made of plastic, um, it slid quite well. And we just uh, clipped on a couple of harnesses. We had dry, little Gore-Tex dry suits on, it's rubber boots, and we just pulled that uh, till we found open water again. Um, sometimes the ice was, uh, sometimes we could find a little opening to paddle in next to the mountainside, right next to the coast. That's because the water's going in and out with waves and with the tide, the small tide that there is, they're leaving a small narrow uh, canal that we could wiggle our way through. And this is John and I just uh, grabbing a hold of the side of the mountain right against the water and uh, uh, with the uh, sea ice to our, our left there and just wiggling our way through, doing whatever we can to make progress for that day. And the sea ice changes from one day to the next. One day it can be like this. The next day a wind comes up, ocean currents change a little bit, and voila, you've got uh, wide open, wide open uh, areas to paddle. Um, quite pleasant. Uh, one of the places we paddled on the East Coast was called the Blossomville Coastline. It's 750 miles of mountains sheer to the waterline. And um, you, uh, you can, and literally the sheer. And so sometimes uh, we had difficult, difficulties finding a place to actually camp. And uh, so we had to look at our maps again, very rudimentary maps at the time because uh, just to, there, there was, uh, Denmark had no detailed maps of this area. And so we, um, we just had to make a guess of where there was probably a good place to camp. And we had to do everything we could to make it there to camp. And uh, sometimes the coastline just didn't allow for a good place to camp. And so we would take our kayak and we would attach it uh, to a, uh, a uh, piece of rock protection and uh, tied up on the side there and we'd uh, go and sleep in the rocks with the uh, seabirds uh, and then uh, get back down and start paddling again. Um, one of the nicer days, you can see from the boulders there, or even a tent platform is kind of difficult there, but it was sure better than sleeping in the rocks with the birds. So we could, we kind of, you know, moved a few big rocks around and tried to put as much padding and any any extra padding we had, we just put on the tent floor and sleep and sleep right on top of these big boulder fields. Um, but then we had uh, some areas that were uh, really scoured rock where it was just like, um, like Canadian shield almost where it's just really smooth and, and flat. And uh, these areas were fun, actually fun to camp on because you had a nice flat platform, you could pull the boat up easy, and you could walk around and stretch your legs a little bit, and uh, we always enjoyed these spots. Um, but we had to be careful not to camp too close to the water because those icebergs that are grounded out in the distance like that, if you're too close to the water edge, if that one of those icebergs calve a uh, chunk of ice, you know, the size of a couple of houses, it will actually sends a wave under the water and under the ice. And then when it reaches the rocks or the shoreline, it forms this huge tidal wave and will wash out everything within 100 yards or 200 yards, or what, depending on where you are of the, of the shoreline. And a lot of hunters have perished in this fashion, a lot of Inuit hunters over the years. Um, and then uh, getting a little further south, we uh, were able to park the tent on some green grass, take a good rest from our trip, write in our journals, and uh, um, uh, go berry picking or what have you once we got into the southern part where there's a little bit more grass, a little bit more greenly, greenery, a little more temperate, um, and, um, and uh, finally coming to the end of our kayaking. We, uh, we were approaching a moss leak, 
um, came across this old hunting shack, first hard shell shack we've seen and uh, that most of that summer. And so we took advantage of it and dried things out. Uh, we were able to uh, do some cooking in there and we spent a couple days here just uh, chilling. We got in the village of, uh, started getting into the villages here. Um, uh, smaller villages, this particular one's called Isertok. Uh, and uh, Masalik, uh, so the, you can see the uh, snow's all gone, pretty, pretty grassy. The ice, sea ice has been, has been broken up for quite some time now. And so with the kayaking journey coming to an end, we started setting our sights on the northwestern part of Greenland, where we would uh, live with uh, Polar Inuit there for a while, uh, train our sled dogs, and get ready for our dog sled journey. Um, this is the Inuit community of Connacht in the far northwest part of Greenland. It's a village of about 500 people back then. I don't know what it is today. Uh, this is a little Polar Inuit village also in the northwest called uh, Sava Civic um, as well, Polar Inuit community. And there's about four about four of these Polar Inuit villages up by Connacht, the Connacht district in the northwest. All Polar Inuit, uh, these are uh, people that still really live a traditional uh, lifestyle. Um, they still um, net these little birds called a pats or in their language called a pilioasuit. And they net these birds by the hundreds. So these birds in the spring come by the tens of thousands. They nest in the rocks behind these villages. And, um, and then if you uh, tuck yourself in the rocks there uh, with a, basically a great big butterfly net on a 16 foot long pole and a big hoop, almost looks like a fishing net, um, you can swoop up and catch catch these birds and they this is one of the main diets of the polar Inuit this is what keeps them fed through the winter um, as well as the summer and uh, most of the summer and so these birds come to these villages in the month of May they catch them they'll 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 cook them up they'll usually boil them whole uh, with feathers on in a pot and then you just peel the feathers back and the skin back and eat the the cooked bird other or they'll can these birds what I call canna, uh, into um, they stuff them into raw uh, seal skins, and they sew these seal skin bladders up tight with about 200 of those birds in, and then they'll take those big bladders, uh, seal skin bladders full of about 200 birds, and they'll bury it uh, under rocks, lots of pressure from rocks on the, on the uh, north side of hills so the sun can't get it. And then throughout the winter, they'll dig up these caches of, of birds, which have now fermented in this seal skin, and it's a delicacy called kibiuk. And uh, that's what kept them alive over the, cent over the last couple of centuries of living up in such a harsh area. Um, this is a little, this is a, some Inuit children uh, in the village of Sabah Civic. Uh, uh, showing off one of the little uh, little um, little ox that they netted earlier that day. And again, like I say, we were in the land now, the Polar Inuit, and this is, uh, these uh, people still hunt, uh, and still hunt by dog team. Um, they, uh, um, and they fish, and they hunt Norwell by kayak. Um, and so, um, uh, still dressed into traditional uh, gear and uh, outfit. This uh, guy is wearing a uh, capita parka. It's a uh, blue fox with blue fox tail around the hood. Um, and then his pants are polar bears, uh, Camex or boots are also polar bear. And they used to have uh, seal skin mitts with polar bear around the wrist there to keep them protected. So they can uh, withstand temperatures, you know, minus 60, 70, below zero in, the, in that outfit. Um, these are some children from uh, a village of uh, Sierrapaluk. This is another polar Inuit village. Uh, and this is the northernmost Inuit village in the world. Um, they're basically 600 miles from the North Pole. Um, 
the sun in these villages, because they're so far north, sets on October 16th and doesn't come back till the end of February. So they have a full, what, four months or something of polar night. And then when the sun comes back, everybody's out hunting and playing in the snow. Um, and so these polar Inuit are known for their, um, um, they hunt polar bears, uh, as well as seals and walrus and uh, narwhal. Um, so they don't, uh, they, they can't go to their local Cub Foods grocery store or Super One. If they want to go get some groceries, they got to hook up the dog teams, go to the flow edge, get some seals, get some walrus, get a narwhal, uh, go on long journeys north to hunt polar bears um, in which their pants are made out of, and their pants are called nanus. And these polar bear pants will, la will uh, last an Inuit hunter uh, for five years of continuous use. So these are like super heavy duty hunter car car hearts. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak, that are actually waterproof. And so uh, because the polar bear is a marine mammal, they also use these polar bear pants for when they're kayaking because those pants give them a lot of cushion while they're kayaking, but they're also water resistant um, and keep their legs warm. So uh, they're used year round, not just, not just in winter. <clears throat> There's a couple of polar bears that uh, they have in this town of Sava Civic. And one, and one of the dogs that looks fairly scarred up from some polar bear hunting in the past. Um, and then uh, all their clothing, uh, most of their cl hunting clothing, their boots, mitts, um, um, some of their uh, clothes as well is made out of seal skin. And this is, a, this is a seal skin on a wooden frame that has been sun bleached. So they scrape the hair and the fat off the seal skin and then they let it the sun bleach it bone white and uh, it's 100% waterproof extremely durable they use it for again mostly mitts and, and boots uh, here gives a, a, a fully dressed uh, fella this his name is Namagitsuk Namagitsuk Christensen and he's sporting a, um, a caribou park up there and uh, polar bear pants and seal skin, seal skin kamiks or boots there. And what he's sitting on is a dog sled called a Kamatik. They're usually tend to run anywhere from 12 to 14 feet long. They're about 30, 32 to 36 inches wide. And they can carry anywhere from, you know, they can carry up to 1200 pounds on there. And they're usually pulled by a, a team, a maximum size of about 12 dogs. Um, this is uh, Takumic Perry. Uh, she's the great great granddaughter of uh, Robert E. Perry, who discovered the North Pole in 1909. And this is her husband, uh, Mama Root uh, Christensen. They're baiting a bunch of hooks with squid to um, uh, lower into a crack in the ice uh, where they're going to try to catch some Greenland halibut. And lo and behold, three hours later, after pulling the lines back up, there, there you go as a Greenland halibut. It, uh, they call them helifisk, and um, it's just basically it's uh, the halibut, just like the halibut you know of, is just a little smaller than the Alaska Pacific halibut. Um, and uh, we were fishing with these folks uh, for three days and got sixty. 64 of these halibut and a couple of Greenland sharks. Everything uh, uh, is um, used for human and dog consumption. So everything that the dogs eat, the Inuit eat and vice versa. Um, so the Inuit dog, which is uh, just barely a domesticated uh, canine and loyal companion of the Inuit hunter and, and is one of the reasons that the Inuit people, not just in Greenland, but across Canada and Alaska were able to survive years ago. Because without dogs, you had no way of traveling or getting around. And um, today in Connacht, uh, even today, your uh, snow machines and ATVs are not allowed. Uh, it's forbidden. And so you, if you want to get anywhere, you have to go by dog team. And so that means 
owning and learning how to run a, a team of dogs. Um, and this is uh, Usakak Hansen. Uh, he's from uh, Connick. He's a great uh, grandson of Matthew Hansen that went with Robert Perry to the North Pole. Um, and a uh, uh, good, good friend of ours has been traveling with us for uh, a lot of the time, a lot of the time we were there in, in the village uh, training and getting ready for our expedition. And um, a lot of these dogs are very well behaved. We're uh, um, um, dicing up a, a seal here uh, to be fed to the dogs. So they're all getting, they're all waiting patiently for their one kilo chunk of, of, of seal skin or seal, uh, seal meat. And um, so the dogs in the winter are fed every day uh, some meat. Uh, and in the summertime, they're fed once every three days. Um, usually some walrus hide that keeps them, uh, the, they, they feel like they're full when they eat a little bit of walrus hide and it takes them a long ways, uh, gets them by for several days. Uh, but in the summer uh, or in the winter when they're worked every day, they're fed a pretty healthy diet of seal meat or walrus or whatever uh, heli fisk we can, uh, we can uh, grab as well. Um, before John and I would leave on our dog said journey, we of course got all the beta from all the Inuit hunters we could, uh, especially the Inuit elders that knew the lay of the land, what to watch out for, uh, how to take care of our dogs in difficult situations and all that kind of stuff. Um, because these, these people are the, they are the masters of Arctic life, of Arctic travel and of, of, uh, um, uh, running sled dogs. So um, we uh, sought their advice at every opportunity. And then we hooked up all our dogs, John and I, and we left the village of Connick in March. And our uh, three end up, we end up being 1900 mile journey, but we did other uh, hundred, a few hundred mile journeys in other areas to complete about 3,000 miles of dog sledding. So all in all in Greenland, we did uh, about half of it in kayak and half of it by dog team. Um, this is our dogs here. We um, didn't, we, hard, we never really rode the sled very often. We would ski gear alongside of it. Um, helping the dogs out a little bit. Uh, we, we, we could also uh, steer the sled from behind. Uh, the dogs worked very well at commands. We'd have a couple of dogs that were on little longer traces than the rest of the dogs. And then the other, all the dogs would kind of follow them and with, and with our commands. And so uh, we had a fantastic uh, team of dogs that we trained several months before we looked, we took off. And, um, and then in storms, they, uh, they were uh, real troopers. They actually uh, did much better in the cold than John and I ever thought we could. Uh, but here's us, we're just untangling the lines. We're waiting for the winds to die down. Uh, we've been stuck in a storm here for a little bit. So we're untangling the lines and then going to each dog and giving them a good rub down, rubbing the snowballs off their face and their fur. And then they were always eager to keep going and uh, actually motivated John and I to often get, get our butts out of the sling bags and out of the tents and get going every day. Um, we had temperatures of minus uh, 58 below zero Fahrenheit straight temperature. So quite cold. It was uh, in order to stay warm in those uh, conditions, we had to constantly be moving. Um, there was no sitting around. Um, we were eating, I don't know, we were eating maybe 5,600 calories a day uh, keep, to keep warm. And then we would, um, when it was this cold, we could only work us, we could only work, we could only travel by dog team and work ourselves about five hours a day because it was just so cold and it just took so much out of you and the dogs that um, we just had to stop early. Whereas as the conditions improved later in the spring, it warmed up a little bit more. We'd often travel nine, 10 hours a day. When it got so cold, like, you know, anything colder than minus 20, I would flip the dog sled upside down and I would, uh, what, what we did was ice the runners. So typically our, our dog sled runners have plastic on them. 
um, which slide pretty good when it's uh, you know warmer than minus 20. But when it's colder than minus 20, what we do is we take a cotton batting and we soak it in warm water, and we roll out this cotton batting over the top of our plastic shoeing, form it around our plastic shoeing, and then we um, we use a carpenter's block plane and shave it once it freezes, so it's fairly smooth. And then I'll add more water out of a warm water over the top of that with a thermos and a little piece of polar bear hide and smooth it out. So when I'm all done with this process, uh, the shoeing is just like glass. It's just like glass. And when you flip it over and push it onto the snow, it glides almost on its own. It's, it's uh, ice on ice is the best um, uh, glide you can get in those, in those temperatures. Uh, it was uh, so. This is typically our setup. We set the uh, put put the dogs out in groups of four or five around the tent as act as polar bear alarm clocks. We set up our north face tent next to our sled. We set up an antenna that you can kind of see above John there. It spreads out, and this is before internet, Facebook. This was before satellite phones. Um, this was before any of that. So we used a, what was called the SBX eleven radio. And we string out this long antenna, hook the uh, center of the antenna on a ski tip, and then run the coaxial into the tent and plug it into the radio. And so we could communicate once a week to a remote weather station uh, that had, that's filled with a handful of scientists. And then they would relay that information to Danish uh, military command in southern Greenland, and then they would relay that information to our friends and family back home letting them know letting everybody know that we were still alive um, we would chop uh, ice uh, off a, a frozen iceberg near our tent off often and bring those chunks into the tent to melt into the drinking water um, while John was doing that I would feed the dogs uh, pieces of frozen pemmican uh, that we made back here in the states and then had shipped to Greenland. High, high calorie diet, each dog got about a kilo a day, which was about 6,000 calories a day. They, they actually uh, performed very well on that. Their coats were very beautiful, as you can see here. Um, and they were eager to work every day and take us wherever we needed to go. The dogs, uh, in addition to the gourmet meal that the dogs got each night, they also got manicures. Uh, every <laughs> every month or so where I would go and trim their uh, the fur from uh, between their pads so they wouldn't build up any snowballs or ice chunks between their toes and cause uh, abrasion or make their feet sore so I would do that not all dogs like it liked uh, this treatment but uh, I would say 75% of them did um, and then they would watch, uh, be on bear watch. This is Caillou, just on bear watch while we're in our tent uh, snoozing uh, until the next day. Um, this is uh, uh, two of our dogs, Puffball and Ray Charles. Puffball being in the front and then Ray Charles in the back. We called uh, the dog in the back Ray Charles because he had the interesting... Uh, uh, um, an interesting thing that he didn't that he didn't share with the rest of the dogs is the all in you know, most all Inuit dogs have black pigment um, in their eyes to help absorb and reflect uh, UV UV radiation, so it keeps them from going snow blind. But uh, but Ray Charles, his uh, pigment he didn't have any pigment in his eyes, and he would later go a little bit not completely blind, but a little bit snow blind uh, as, the te as the sun arose uh, later in the spring. And so he would always be next to his buddy, uh, Puffball, uh, when we were traveling and Puffball would keep him going in the straight and narrow there. Inside the tent, uh, we were sporting a, a couple of COVID beards there. <laughs> back in the day. Um, inside the tent, uh, John's again uh, putting ice chunks into the pot for melting. I'm on the single sideband radio trying to communicate to the military folks to the south. 
letting them know our position. We heard some whining from the dogs when we were in the tent and we thought a polar bear was entering camp. And when I poked my head out low and behold, there was actually four polar wolves. These are the northernmost wolves in the world. These are northern, more northern than the, the wolves that are known to exist on Ellesmere Island that Dave Brandenburg and David Meech filmed years ago. These are a, a little um, group that li lives probably another 40 to 50, no, actually they live uh, maybe closer to 100, 150 miles further north than uh, those wolves on Ellesmere Island. But these uh, guys came in to have our sled dogs for lunch, but uh, um, luckily I got out of the tent and um, they were a bit t intimidated, so they left. But otherwise they would have dispatched our sled dogs and ate them. So, uh, um, but they did follow us uh, for a couple of days afterwards, which was fine with me as long as they didn't uh, attack our dogs. And uh, it was one of those extremely wild moments uh, and with a bit of awe and wonder of how these animals are able to exist in such a um, harsh environment. And of course, they, they live on uh, muskox uh, in the hills and what seals that come up out of the ice and lay on top of the snow in the summer months to get a little uh, extra sun, they'll grab those seals every now and then too. Around the northern edge of Greenland, this is uh, uh, Perryland in the background. And uh, this is our dogs, our sled. Um, John and I fly in the National Geographic flag on the northernmost piece of real estate in the world. This is uh, the closest land to the North Pole um, called Ka Kafaklubin Island. Heading south, back, uh, after getting close to finishing the expedition, a nice uh, picture of sun dog through sun dog formed by ice crystals uh, going through the air in front of the sun, and then finally reaching Connacht at the end of our journey, completing at that time almost 3,000 miles of dog sledding. This is our lead dog, Canood, who got us where we needed to go. And uh, so this lead, this uh, is where I, uh, Finish the uh, finish the the presentation, but go on to talk a little bit about what we got coming up in the near future. So we got an expedition in 2021 and 2022 in Greenland called Pulling for the Planet, and it's basically a um, two-year project to film um, uh, the extreme remote sections of East Greenland, but then. Uh, but the main part of the filming will be um, all about the polar Inuit in Northwest Greenland. So we're going there to, uh, with the film crew, spending five months traveling by dog, dog sleds to all the Inuit villages and find out how their lives have changed uh, since I was there 20 years ago. So I have, are they doing things different? Are, what are, are they seeing different migration patterns in the wildlife? Um, um, are the birds that they net, are they coming earlier? Are they coming later? Are they coming at all? Um, um, are they doing less fishing, more walrus hunting? Uh, how are they adapting to a warming climate? So we're gonna do that and we're gonna basically film uh, their, their culture. And so we, we currently got a good portion of our funding for that project. And um, yeah, so we're excited to, uh, we're excited about that. And um, um, and the, that expedition pulling for the planet was supposed to start this summer, but of course with the COVID-19, we had to push it um, um, uh, forward an entire year. And we did that for, you know, and we may have to push it again another year, or hopefully we don't, but uh, we have to be also very careful that we don't bring uh, COVID-19 to some of these remote areas. So we want to make sure that everything is safe and sound before we proceed into these extremely remote areas uh, that have um, um, polar Inuit families and uh, communities. So, uh, 
with what we're doing, what I'm doing now, um, you know, I've had a lot of people ask me um, in the recent weeks, how are we, how am I dealing or how should we be dealing or um, looking at this whole COVID-19 pandemic? And um, I think what we, how we need to kind of look at it is, um, we need to look at it as an expedition for one. We need to look at it not as a short-term thing, but a long-term expedition. So it's like when I get to the edge of the Arctic Ocean to cross at pulling sleds with uh, Eric Larson years ago, you can't think about when you get to the edge of the Arctic Ocean, on the Arctic Ocean one and a half times bigger than the United States, you can't think about, oh, how long is it going to take us to get there? How long is it going to take us to get to the North Pole some 600 miles? We're pulling a sled of 200 pounds. And you, you can't think of all the negatives. You can just pick at it one day at a time and just make it your life and do the best job you can. And so with this pandemic, how I'm looking at it is kind of like an expedition where, okay, this could be long term, it could be a couple of years. So how can I be proactive in um, keeping friends and family safe? Uh, how uh, look at it as a challenge as your goal to um, be uh, proactive uh, with uh, this uh, pandemic and just um, educate yourself as much as you can about uh, what's going on in the world and what's going on with this pandemic and uh, those um, um, uh, to to make a plan for moving forward um, and then try to find uh, the, that that thread of of that um, silver lining um, that um, when it's hard to see the silver lining in such a, a dire situation when people are out of work and people are getting sick. Uh, but this, uh, this, the, the silver lining is that prior to this, we've all been moving at uh, such a fast pace. Uh, everybody is so busy, busy, busy that we don't get time to spend with our friends, our family. We don't have downtime with the kids. Um, we don't have um, all these little things of, of cooking dinner together or baking bread or it's, it's bringing us back to our roots that we didn't expect. And, um, and, then, um, and then also looking at it is that we're also giving, you know, because it's, we're not going back to the same thing as we were before. I think this is going to change the world as a whole in a big way. And I think it will make us think about how we have treated the planet in the past and what we can do different moving forward. And um, yeah, so I think uh, I also look at it as the, the water, the ocean, the skies are also getting a break from airplanes and uh, travel and industry and stuff like that. It's forcing us to stop and smell the flowers, go on hikes, you know, do those kind of things that we even go fishing um, or whatever, um, do that woodworking project. So it's those kind of things that I think are good and it's something going to stick with us for a long time and, uh, and, uh, and mother, mother is getting a break and that's, that's a good thing too. So, um, so from here, I'll, uh, I'll end my uh, presentation. I'll take any questions um, from the audience. And so, uh, Jessa, if you want to lead that, that would be great. Do I need to do anything special on my end? Do I need to? Uh, no, you can stop sharing okay. your screen or you can leave it up. That's just fine. I think I'll just leave it up. This will be good. All right. So yeah, we've had some questions come in. Let's see. John Matheson would like to know why um, the houses have bright colors and what are they made of? Well, the bright, uh, the, a lot of these uh, designs are Scandinavian design, mainly out of Denmark. And these are, um, um, they use primary colors because they're, they're, they're stick built structures with steep pitch roof that withstand uh, any heavy snow loads, but also um, are fairly small, easy to heat. I mean, they might only be uh, 18 to 22 feet square. 
And they use primary colors because it, get, it puts smiles on people's faces, right? It's like uh, going to North House, right? Down to North House Hawk School and you got the blue building and the red building and the yellow building. Those primary colors, um, I think, just put smiles on, it's like flowers. It's like put smiles on people's faces because you're in a land of snow and ice and gray rock. So when you're on a long hunting journey or on a long sailing trip and you're coming back home and all you can see is these big primary colors on the distance on the hillside, it's a beautiful thing. And, uh, and I'm hoping that this, that would uh, inspire people in our country to start using more colors in their housing designs you know i don't know that's just my get, opinion we get a lot of questions at north house about what exact pantone the yellow building and the red building are so i think they definitely inspire people um let's yeah. try and ask what kind of animals did you encounter oh wow we uh all the arctic animals you can think of uh arctic wolves of course polar bears uh narwhals lots of Norwhales. I had a mother, I was kayaking on the East Coast and I had a mother, a mother Norwhal come up right to the right side of my kayak. I could have reached out and grabbed her tail. And then just underneath her was a little, maybe four foot long baby, little gray Norwhal uh, 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 swimming just to the underside of, of mom, which was beautiful. Um, we've seen a lot of fin whales uh minke whales which were uh, right under our kayaks which was fun um let's see um yeah i mean uh, uh just a, a plethora of arctic birds uh little uh gillimits, uh to those ox to um greenland sharks for uh we had uh um you know all kinds of cool animals that we've seen in the arctic yeah it was amazing great um, Kristen asks, did you ever capsize? Ah, we did. We, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, all those miles of kayaking, we only capsized once. And we got caught off guard. So what happens is when John and I were uh, paddling our double kayak, uh, we were fairly close to the uh, shoreline. Matter of fact, you could, you could reach over and touch the cliff we were paddling next to. Right, and so we're paddling, and an iceberg way out in the distance capped the huge chunk of ice, and we weren't thinking much about it. And what had happened is this tidal wave came really stealth-like underneath the surrounding sea ice, and when it got close to the coast, of course, it built up. And so what happened is this water hit this cliff that we're right next to. So it brought our boat up right alongside the cliff. And then when it was going down, the rocks snagged the underbelly of our kayak and flipped us upside down. And we went upside down like this. And as the water was going out, it sucked John and I out of the boat. And it sucked us out and deposited us underneath floating pans of ice. So when I opened up my eyes, I'm in the water, underneath the water, I open up my eyes, and I look and my head hit the top of the, uh, the bottom side of this ice pan and I could see way in the distance the hull color of the boat and I swam underneath the ice and came out at the boat. And I was, you know, I had a little bit of air left, but not much. That sounds <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> it, was, it was completely terrifying. And what was <laughs> even more terrifying is John was nowhere to be seen. So I'm swimming around the boat, I'm looking all over, and then all of a sudden it seemed like an eternity, John pops out, and he's coughing and spitting up salt water. And um, it was later on in the expedition, so both of our dry suits leaked around the necks. So we needed to get out of the water in a hurry. So we brought everything up to the shore where we could find a place to get out. Not a real safe place to get out, but we had to get out, we got out, we threw everything up on shore that was completely soaked. We stripped down. We, we were, we were hypothermic. We, yeah, it was a mess. We were all played out and, uh, well, we, we got through it, but we were all played out the, the, for the next couple of days, just cause we were shivering our butts off so much. But, um, we just 
pounded down as much uh, food as we could, drank as much hot water as we could to stave off hypothermia, and wring out as much water as we could out of everything we had and then put it on. And then hope, and then in three days that we wore it, basically wore it dry. <laughs> we had dried out on our bodies. Yeah. Um, speaking of John, uh, Betsy asked if you would give an update on him. Uh, yeah, John is in, uh, live, has been living in Australia. He lives in uh, not far from Brisbane in uh, Queensland. And uh, he is married and um, has a couple of uh, grown uh, children, uh, stepchildren actually, uh, from his his uh, marriage that, and he still, uh, I think he's still working as a, a Sparky, they call him, electrician. And um, he's doing quite well. I'm hoping to get him uh, back this way someday soon because he left a lot of friends here uh, in Cook County, so. Great. Uh, who was taking the photos that uh, both of you were in? Uh, I took most of the majority of the images. And uh, if there were photos taken with both of us, it usually was a tripod with a timer. So it was an old timey camera. It was a Yushika plastic, uh, get, get this, it's a plastic Yushika body, but it's just like a old Nikon FM2, except for it was half the weight. And, mm -hmm. I, and I took this plastic body, but I stuck Zeiss lenses on it. So I uh, had really good quality glass, but a, a very lightweight manual camera and I shot slide film. So all the pictures were uh, taken with Kodachrome 64 or Velvia 50 if people, some of the older folks out there might know, know what those were. Great, a uh, couple of questions about the fermented bird and if you got to try it and what it tasted like. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that bird dish is called Kivyuk and Kivyuk is, um, so again, it's these birds stuffed in a seal skin. It's so tight, so it's watertight. So when, when they get those birds and they get that stuffed in there, they want to get all the air out. So they sew everything up a little bitty hole in one part of the seal skin. And then they, usually a couple of kids will be jumping up and down on the seal skin to get all the rest of the air out. And then they'll do the final sew job on it. So you got this maybe 200 seals canned in this seal skin. And then, um, you know, after it's been sitting in the rocks for a couple months, you dig it up or you can leave it sit longer if you like. And what happens is the inside of that seal skin, the fat from the inside of that kind of marbleizes into the birds. And these birds are whole. They're in there with their feathers and feet and heads and on still and everything. And they, they uh, ferment. So they're, uh, when you grab one of these birds or like a little greasy bird with the feathers still on and you peel back the uh, feathers, but behind the back of the wings, you peel back the feathers and you get all the, the hide off of them. You eat that fat off the inside of the hide. And then the meat is kind of like a purple black almost. And um, um, it um, is, smells awful, uh, but it, uh, the taste is, um, it, taste is, uh, it smells like a blue cheese, like a really strong blue cheese or Limburger cheese, but it has, it doesn't have the ta the strong taste. It has just kind of a, uh, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, it's like no other taste. It's like almost like a, it's like a fishy taste in duck almost. Um, doesn't sound appealing, but it takes a while to get used to them. I prefer them boiled and then I eat them, but uh, yeah. You definitely have to. You definitely have to wash your hands. Not not just before, but after you eat those things. <laughs> sure, <laughs> and probably your whole, your whole body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, a couple of questions about your interactions with the Inuit. Um, how you communicated, and if they were welcoming, um, or if there was resistance to you being there. Uh, no, they were very welcoming. They knew of uh, my. Uh, some of them knew of my past as dog sledding. I dog sledded a lot in the Arctic uh, in Canada. So some of them knew a little bit about me prior. Um, and then um, we, they, they knew that we came to them by kayak, which was important. Um, we came to them in their traditional uh, 
um, kayaking manner, and we drove dog teams. We knew how to um, work and travel with dogs, which was highly respected because very few people can do that, especially with the Inuit dogs, which are very wild. Um, and so, um, and our, our love of their culture, they knew we were just in awe of them, uh, which we were, and they, they respected that. We, we were good little listeners and we learned everything we could and, and we always asked them questions and um, we um, always offered them whatever we had uh, as well uh, from the expedition. And so, um, yeah, so we, um, and because we traveled to all these village, all these Inuit villages um, by dog team ahead of our expedition and visited with everybody, um, they appreciated that. Um, how we communicated with you, we, we, back then we learned a little bit of Inuktitut, and I lost most of it now, but um, um, we learned a little bit of that. Don, John uh, learned some Danish, which they understood a little bit of Danish because Greenland was then owned by Denmark at the time. It's currently under home rule now. And then, uh, you know, when you, when, when, you, when you drive dogs and they drive dogs, there's a lot of things that just pantomime will get you by. So we did some of that and uh, yeah, I don't know. After spending uh, so many years there over the course of so many, you know, so many winters and stuff, we, uh, yeah. And they picked up a little English actually uh, as well. So uh, yeah, so it worked out pretty good. Great. Let's see, question about the dogs. Did you have a favorite dog and why? And can, did you have any examples of them being barely domesticated? Well, um, my favorite dog was Canood because he was our leader, but I also like Puffball because he just was cute and Puffball-y like. Uh, uh, um, but uh, Canood was amazing. He uh, took commands very well. He steered the dogs. Uh, when those wolves came out, he was the first one to uh, go after those wolves, even though he was tied, um, uh, trying to protect his team. Uh, so he was uh, quite a character. Um, so I really, uh, really like Canood. Um, uh, do, barely domesticated. So um, if the, uh, the dogs are quite wild. So these dogs will, uh, uh, can hunt polar bear. They'll chase a polar bear down and keep a polar bear at bay. A big polar bear. You know, a bunch of these dogs. They, polar bear doesn't like all them little yappy dogs around them. And so they just kind of keep them under control. But also uh, they've been known to... Um, also kill and eat the hunter that's actually driving them. So let's say the, the, the hunter is, uh, let's say they haven't been fatted in a long time. Um, times are tough, whatever. Um, the hunter is leading in front and he drops and he falls down by accident. The dogs uh, act uh, still very wild. They'll act, if one dog uh, goes to bite the hunter, they say when one dog acts, it says one head for the whole team. So one dog is commanding every, all the other brains of the dogs to go and do it. So you can easily get killed by your dogs if you're not careful. And then, so the good trick there is to take good care of them and feed them every day and you know, give, them, give them lots of good pets and stuff like that. Pretty good example of not domesticated if they will each. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they will. Yeah. Um, did the dog team leashes get tangled up? Uh, uh, Florius notes that that is uh, often a problem. The what? The leashes oh. getting tangled? Oh, yeah, the tug lines. Well, uh, so the tug lines are, so the tug lines are, are all made uh, 18 foot long traces. So each dog's 18 feet long. And they're on a special line. It's a polyethylene line that's uh, three strand twisted nylon braided uh, polyethylene basically. And so when they create a knot, um, and this is usually they create knots when you're training a team that hasn't been run a lot together. So they'll create a knot because they're always moving and looking for new positions and who do they want to run with and things like that. And so your knot can be, you know, after a course of an hour running, it can be three, three feet long, right? You're not. So what you do is you get the dogs to lay down and then you grab the line from where it is at behind the dog and you feed it through your hand 
and it feeds through the rest of the knot, you put that on your hand, a little loop around of the, the dog trace has a loop at the end, and then you do it with the next dog. And then in less than uh, a couple of minutes, you have all the dogs untangled, you hook them up again. So a well-trained dog team, uh, they always travel in the same exact spot for three months. So Puffball, like Puffball and Ray Charles, they always travel next to each other, right? So you never had to untangle their lines. Um, and, and all the dogs are like that after you run them for a while. So you might be able to run for three, four hours before you actually need to stop the dog team to untangle the line. And untangle the line is very simple. The biggest thing, biggest trick is to get all the dogs to sit down and to stay seated while you have them disconnected from the sled because if they decide to bolt and you're a thousand miles away from home, that's not a good thing. And with all your supplies. <laughs> So you have a, so you have a, you have to have really good command over your dogs and uh, you know untangling them is not not an issue at all. Yeah. Uh, did you ever get sick? Um, what medical supplies did you carry? And then how were the was your resupply um, was it delivered by dog sled during the trip? No. So this uh, well, uh, as far as the resupply goes. Um, that was 20 years ago. So back then, um, we shipped everything by ice breaking ship from Denmark all the way to as far north as we could get it as, as we could because we wanted to uh, eliminate as much flying with by aircraft the supplies as possible. So we put it on an ice breaking ship with supplies that were going to other stations in Greenland scientific bases, for instance, weather stations. So they dropped all of our stuff there and then they hopscotched it along the northern part of Greenland in, in, um, in um, cahoots with a Danish military patrol supply plane. So the logistics of this project took me years to iron out with the governments, but and to allow the military to for us to uh, go help be on some of their flights and we split the costs on that and so every 200 to 375 miles we placed 500 pounds of dog food people food and gas for our for our stoves on our dog sled journey is what we did yeah uh, yeah, did you get sick and did you carry medical supplies? Uh, yeah, of course we carried medical supplies because if we got sick out there, there was nothing we could do about it. Um, by the, it's not, we didn't have an emergency locating transmitter. You know, we couldn't press the button and people would come get us. Um, we could only communicate with our, our radio once a week um, because we were limited on batteries, but also where we were um, uh, because no one would be listening. We had a set schedule once a week with some, with a military post. So if we got sick, we were on our own. Um, but we were young, you know, we would figure we'd get through. Um, as far as medical supplies we had, we had a lot of different things. We had some, we had some antibiotics, uh, broad spectrum anti antibiotics. We had an antibiotic that would help maybe stave off appendix, appendicitis burst. So at least, keep the infection from making uh, the appendix burst until we could get out of there. Um, we had, um, everything else was kind of makeshift uh, stuff, you know, as far as splints, you could make, make that out of anything. Um, we had a soak, uh, we had a, a soak kit for both us and the dogs as well, cause they would get in fights every now and then and need to be sewn up. So, uh, things like that, uh, mostly um, a few bandages, those kind of things. But uh, yeah, nothing, nothing, nothing much actually. Well, got through okay. So <laughs> yeah, uh, Carolyn DeLuca asks if you wore any uh, traditional Inuit clothing uh, on the trip. Uh, well, yeah, we we, we actually wore. Um, we had. Uh, Seal, uh, we had seal skin mitts that were trimmed in polar bear fur around their cuffs. 
Um, they were the best way to uh, work the Iparautuk, which is this long steering whip to steer the dogs one way or the other. Um, and then um, um, we, um, we had, um, we had two, two, two pairs of Kamex each. We had a sealskin Kamex um, that were traditional, and then we had a Steger Mucklock is what we used. Um, there we had fur ruffs around both of our parkas. I had a wolverine. John had a wolf, uh, wolf around there. And then we had, um, let's see, we all, John had a pair of polar bear pants. Um, he used, um, and I'm trying to think it was so long ago. Um, oh, and we slept on caribou hides. We slept on, uh, two caribou hides, uh, um, uh, Actually, three went in the tent, and then one, each one of us had one that we laid on. So it was warmer than any ground pad. Sure. Yeah. Uh, did you have crampons to get around on the ice, and did you carry any weapons? Uh, we had uh, we had a right we had a rifle, and we had uh, no crampons to get around on the ice. We didn't need them. Yeah, we're on flat sea ice, so that wasn't a big deal. And then there was. Uh, uh, what little bit of uh, glacial travel we did on top of the ice cap, uh, we didn't need um, uh, crampons for that either. Yeah. Uh, let's see, any special treat items in your resupplies, like chocolate and whiskey? <laughs> um, let's see, we had, um, trying to think. You know, every time we went to one of those resupplies, um, there would be a little treat from one of the somebody from town that helped us pack these um, these our supply depots because they were all packed in Grand Marais and then shipped to Denmark and then shipped to Greenland. And so um, um, we had some coffee, I think, in uh, one of the depots, which was quite a treat. Um, but I think one of the biggest treat uh, that we found is we were in an extremely remote uh, military hut, which is about 10 foot square in the middle of absolute nowhere. And under the bunk of this little hut, we found uh, a jug of, of, of uh, vodka and a little uh, bit of pipe tobacco. And it happened to be my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and so John and I celebrated my birthday that night at that so it was a, quite a treat and we it was nice coming to the hut because we could relax the dogs fatten them up and then um and then uh you know carry on our merry way fat and fat and sassy sounds like a good birthday Let's see just a couple more here um how old are your children and are they interested in joining you on a future expedition well, I have, uh, my, both my boys are in their thirties and they are not, uh, one is a computer programmer and the other one's a fisher, kind of an outdoorsman, uh, uh, fisherman, hunter, that kind of thing. But, uh, a little bit of, uh, glamping, glamping, uh, but, uh, uh, other than that, I think, uh, uh, any kind of extreme project like, uh, Freezing your butt off on the way to the North Pole doesn't sound so uh, too appealing uh, <laughs> to those guys. Uh, but um, um, yeah, yeah. And I, sometimes I wonder if they even uh, understand fully some of the projects that we've done over the years because you, it, it's, it's some of it, some of it's a little nuts and off the wall for sure. <laughs> uh, what months were you traveling in? Well, in Greenland, we traveled uh, all but the breakup months. So we traveled all of summer, all of most of winter. So summer months for kayaking is usually June through the third week in August. And then the dog sledding was middle of February to the end of May is usually when. And then the time periods on both sides of that, which we call breakup or I, or polar night or breakup, depending on the time of year, uh, is usually when we spent in the villages. Yeah. All right, just two more, um, both great questions. First, any plans to teach a dovetail class in the near future? 
Thanks, Chris Stanton. I have that question too. <laughs> um, I think so. I think so. I think uh, I'd love, I would love to uh, get back and do that again. And uh, yeah, I think uh, when things settle down a little bit, I'd like to get in there and maybe teach a teach class. I miss it a lot. And uh, um, yeah, and so things are uh, things are just been so busy with this Greenland project we're coming up we got coming up in 2021, 22. Then I'm hoping that after 22, I'll be able to spend a little more time down at campus and and whittling away on some timbers. Yeah, we hope so too. Uh, and I, the last question comes to us from Carolyn uh, Deluca. What is it about the North that keeps drawing you back? The thing I always liked about the North is it's wide open spaces and um, things that you find on the surface, especially in the high Arctic, um, like old relics or uh, tent rings left by uh, old Inuit encampments have been there hundreds and hundreds of years, but look like they were placed there yesterday. Right. And so it's like, well, it's just like you have history laid out uh, for you to explore um, around every corner. And um, and of course, being from Minnesota, I, I just uh, have a love on for snow and ice. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's I guess that's why. Good answer. All right. Well, Lonnie, thank you so much for doing this with us. It's uh, it's really fun to be able to connect, even in this way that you probably couldn't have ever dreamed of when you were taking the first trips in Greenland. Um, thanks yeah. for attending. We um, will have a poll right now. I'm about to make that happen, where if you are interested in um, getting the e-news from North House, which will keep you up to date, uh, you can click in on there and it'll help you, uh, we'll get you signed up. Uh, next Thursday, our uh, webinar will be with Harley and Norma Refsal, who um, are also uh, founding uh, instructors at the school. And uh, they'll be showing and talking about um, pieces from their personal collection and about uh, the folk art and handcraft of Norway. So. Mark your calendar. That'll be uh, next Thursday at seven o'clock. So, all right. Thanks so much, Lonnie. Take care. Take care, everybody. We will see you soon.